there comes a moment for every one of us. Not one of us are an exception to this human rule. There's a moment when we need to hear about forgiveness. No matter how many times I preach about forgiveness, someone always comes to me and says, that's what I needed to hear. No matter how many times we talk about forgiveness, someone says, there'll be another time to talk about it. No doubt we could enumerate the hurts that range from misunderstandings, character assassinations, double crosses, mean-spirited attacks, lies, being cheated, being physically or emotionally abused, betrayal, and many more. There's so many ways to be hurt, and so many of us have been through it. Like one writer said recently, if hurts were hairs, we'd all look like grizzlies. Were we to ledger our losses, it would include loss of finances, loss of innocence, loss of relationships, loss of opportunities, loss of reputation, and so much more. We've lost years we can't get back and shed tears until we ran dry. Someone took your best friend. They stole your husband. They ravaged your bank account. They destroyed your childhood. They took your virginity. They tanked your business. At times, you've been hurt by virtual strangers, and more often, you've been hurt by people who you knew well and were very close to you. And so without exception, without exception, we grapple with the issue of forgiveness. Just ask Victoria Rivolo. On a snowy night in Manhattan, New York City, November 2004, she was driving home from an event. She had just watched her niece, who was 14 years old, sing her debut with a band. It was nigh unto midnight. She was driving along, had no idea that night on those snow-covered roads. Her life would never be the same. Traveling in the opposite direction, there was a car filled with six teenagers. Using a stolen credit card, they had purchased, of all things, a 20-pound frozen turkey. As they passed at a high speed, 19-year-old college freshman Ryan Cushing had his window rolled down, violently threw the turkey out his window, it impacted Victoria's car with so much velocity that the turkey smashed through the window, bent her steering wheel, and crushed her face. More than one fireman from the local fire company in responding to the accident testified that Ravolo would have died there on the spot had it not been for the fact that that evening she had brought a friend along. His name was Lou. He was able from the passenger seat to navigate the car to the side of the road and then, until emergency help arrived, held her chin up or they say she would have drowned in her own blood and died on the spot. Two weeks later, Rivolo woke up from an induced coma, having no idea what had happened. But she learned that every bone had been broken in her face, that she had required a tracheotomy, that she now had four titanium plates permanently placed in her face, and that she had a metal mesh holding her left eye in place because her socket had been completely destroyed by the impact. The perpetrator was found and indicted for charges that carried up to a 25-year jail sentence. Just listening to that story today makes you angry. I read it, felt the heat of fury rise up in me against that young man. And certainly, we recognize the right to be angry when someone has been wronged. We ourselves when we are wounded, when we are injured. Ask, does God really expect 
that after what I've been through or what that person did, I shouldn't be angry? Am I supposed to be abused or mistreated in this life and not have it cause some kind of emotions? Someone who should have known better. Someone who did know better. Someone intentionally or unintentionally has taken from me and it makes me angry. And you see, the Bible does not say to us that we can't be angry. Rather, the Bible gives to us the escape route so that anger does not have to lead to unforgiveness. And that is the crucial thing I want you to understand today. That you and I do not have to live our lives in bondage to bitterness and an unforgiving spirit. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 spells out the secret to us. I want you to read it out loud with me today. Let's read it together. It's on the screen. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. This brief verse gives us the way to walk through the secrets of forgiveness. I'm going to share them with you. There's three. Look at it this way. The first one is this. Don't try to get even. One of the secrets to forgiveness is don't try to get even. Let's look back at the verse again and see the first expression. You see that first line that's bold and read that with me. In your anger, do not sin. As a little kid, you heard two wrongs don't make a... That's right, and Jesus said it this way. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek to them. Now, Jesus is undoing this idea. He is saying, you have always heard it said, if they take your eye, you have a right to take their eye. If they knock out your tooth, you have a right to knock out theirs. Jesus says, no longer are we looking at this from a Merit to merit concept. But rather, we are going to set someone free by not trying to get even. We are going to throw away the idea that most of us live with that we have the right to even the scales. That we have a right to balance the ledger. Jesus says, if you want the freedom of forgiveness, burn the ledger. Throw away the scales. Forget trying to get even. <coughs> Two golfers had been best friends for years, had golfed together hundreds of times. Bob was a much better golfer than Joe. But one day as they were playing, Joe said to Bob, tomorrow, I want us to golf head-to-head -head against each other for money. Bob said, are you kidding, Joe? He said, no, I'm serious, and even up. You don't have to give me any strokes advantage. Even up, 100 bucks. Bob said, Joe, you don't want to do that. Joe said, yes, I do. So Bob said, all right, tomorrow. So he went home and told his wife, said, you know what? <laughs> Joe wants me to golf with him tomorrow. And she said, well, you've been playing golf with him for 20 years, and you've never even come close to him beating you. He said, all right, well, that's what we're going to do. So the next day, Bob and Joe went golfing. When Bob got home that night, Walked in, his wife said, well, did you make easy money today? And he said, no, I lost. She said, how could you lose? You, you've been golfing with the guy for 20 years. He doesn't, he doesn't even get close to your score. You couldn't. You could golf one-handed and beat him. What happened? He said, well, we got up on the tee box to start the very first hole. And Joe said to me, as I promised you, I don't want you to grant me any strokes, even up on the strokes, but all I want you to do is give me two gotchas. He said, I didn't really know what a gotcha was, but I said, okay, you can have two gotchas. She said, well, what happened? Bob said, well, I, I lined up for my first shot. I wound back, and right when I was in this position, Joe came up behind me, grabbed me right here, pinched as hard as he could, twisted as hard as he could. Man, it hurt so bad. And he said, gotcha. So his wife said, well, so what did it do? It injured you and you couldn't golf the rest of the time? He said, no, it didn't. It didn't injure me. It only hurt. She said, then what happened? He said, I spent the entire rest of the round, every shot, waiting for the second gotcha. <laughs> she 
Truth be told, many of us want to hold on to the right to get even. And we love the fact that someone who has wounded us might just be wondering or worrying when the hammer's going to drop, when the other shoe is going to fall, when we are going to be able to say, gotcha. And we can cherish in our hearts developing that fear in them. And in that way, we never let it go. But can I tell you something? The first thing you can learn to say that will set you into the freedom of forgiveness is you don't have to fear me. I want us to say that together today. Say it with me. You don't have to fear me because I'm not trying to get even. You don't have to fear me or wonder any longer because I'm not trying to get even. But Pastor Todd, they never said, I'm sorry, and if I don't settle the score, doesn't that mean I'm the one who lost? Didn't they win if they got away with it and I never evened it up? The answer to that question is no, they did not. And here's why. Because we relinquish the job of keeping score to God. It is for him to decide what to do with the ledger. Let God deal with the gotchas. You see, forget getting even. Wipe the ledger clean because isn't that what God did for you? Anybody glad today that God didn't try to settle the score with us as sinners? So the first thing is, don't try to get even. You don't have to fear me. Here's the second. Don't let those who injured your past impact your future. Don't let those who injured your past impact your future. Look at the sentence. sentence. In your anger, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. In other words, stop holding on to it. Stop letting it fester. Let it be in the past. Just let it go. Is refusing to forgive and constantly conjuring this in your memory making your life better? Come on, when was the last time you, you heard somebody say, when I feel bitter, the skies look bluer? <laughs> when was the last time someone said, when I'm merciless, my blood pressure stays under control? <laughs> Nobody says, I sleep great when I'm feeling vengeful. Nobody says people like to be around me when I am full of resentment. In fact, let me say this to you today. When we hang on to bitterness and let it control our future as well as our past, we tend to therefore create bitterness and seek out others and we surround ourselves with other people who are bitter. And now we're telling our angry story and they're telling their angry story. And we're merely festering this and building it together. When we continue to rehearse what happens in our head, when we still let it make us mad, when it still makes us sad, when we still add up all that could have been and all we have lost, it's as if we roll around with an IV pole and a bag full of bitterness that just continues to fire inside of us. And until we say, you know what, I'm just not connected to that anymore. Until we say, I'm letting that go, we all are like a sick, sick ward rolling around with our bags of anger. Some of us actually can find in a twisted way a relishing of that angry, bitter feeling as it rolls around inside of us. We play with it on the end of our tongue. But in the end, we're only granting ongoing power to them because what they have done continues to impact us. So here's what you need to say. You won't control me. Come on, say it with me. You won't control me. 
In other words, not only are we saying you don't have to fear me, but we're saying you won't control me. You don't exercise power over my tomorrow just because you exercised power over my yesterday. You won't control me. Some of us mistakenly think that we can't do this one because as humans, it's impossible to forget. Like, God forgets. It's amazing that God can do that. The Bible says that he, he gets to where he forgets our transgressions and doesn't hold them against us any longer. We say, Pastor Todd, how can I forget? Don't you know, things come up in my mind and, and it makes me remember what happened. Are you, are you telling me that God's going to give me like a memory wipe so that I, I just won't ever remember what they did? I doubt that'll ever happen. If it does, blessings on you. You'll probably be able to remember it and things will, will come up that will remind it of you. Remind you of it. <laughs> so if you can't forget, how is it possible to do this? The secret is that we're told that one of the actions we take place in Christians' lives is taking captive every thought. Not, I'll never think about it again, but I won't let myself go to back to those dark places that allows my past to keep impacting my future. I'll take that thought captive. And then the rest of it says, and make it obedient to Christ. So I will say, it's not that I don't remember they did that to me. I just don't let it continue to harm me. It's done. It's been forgiven. Which then takes us to the third and final step, which is this. Decide to move on. Say that with me. Decide to move on. So now look at the verse again. In your anger, do not sin. Do not the sun go down while you're still angry. And then what's that last part say? And do not give the devil a foothold. Don't say, you know what? You know what? I'm just going to keep giving him that opportunity. Nope. Nope. I'm moving on. You know, over the years, you, like I, have met some amazing people in this world. People who, as you talk to them, you discover they're extremely generous, or they're very kind, or they're always so helpful. Or there's just this spirit about them that makes it a joy to be around them. They have so much impact and, and, and you can just see God all over them. And you've met people like that. And you just walk away from people like that and go, wow, that's just so neat. But I bet if your experience is like mine, every now and then you learn about a backstory from one of those people. All the garbage that they went through. What someone did to them how they lost their first business because someone cheated them. Or in their childhood, they were mistreated. Or their best friend ran off with their husband or ran off with their... You, you'll hear these, these horrible stories, terrible things, but yet you look at them and they're this beautiful person. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been through that? And you say to yourself, I would have never guessed that that person has that kind of backstory. How'd they ever do that? You know what I've discovered? And I want you to think through with me and, and see if you think I'm right today. I've discovered that 100% of the time, if you speak to them long enough, at some point they will say this, well, I had to get to the place where I decided I had been this way for a while, one day I was reading God's word about forgiveness, and I decided, come on, I, what, decided to move on. I decided to forgive. I decided not to keep circling back. I knew I couldn't move forward, they'll say, until I decided. You see, we get to decide. To move on. You are the one that chooses to forgive. You are the one that says, I'm canceling the debt. You're the one that says, I'm letting you go because in doing so, I'm going to open my life up to so much more. That's your decision today. You see, the third thing you say is this You don't owe me. You know what I decided? You don't owe me. I'm not collecting on that ledger. You just don't owe me. 
Victoria Ruvolo walked into the courtroom on the day the judge was declaring sentencing on Ryan Cushing. She said her heart went out to him when she saw this young 19-year-old little kid, she said. In recounting the story, she says he, he was wearing a, a suit and, and tie and was kind of hunched over. She said he, he looked like the suit was three times too big for him. So frail. She sat in the courtroom as the judge pronounced the sentence. And though he could have gone to jail for 25 years, the courtroom went into an absolute uproar when the judge announced that he would go to jail for six months with five years of probation. People stood up and began to shout and, and scream and, and, and cry foul. How could such a light sentence be given for such a destructive act that had almost taken Victoria's life? But you know what? Rivolo wasn't angry. She didn't get up and scream. You know why? She was the reason he was given such a light sentence. As Ravolo was recovering from her injuries and home, she began to realize in following the news that this story was percolating all over the place. That anger within New York City was rising up over this ridiculous and, 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 and life-altering action that this young man had done. And, and there, was, there was cries of bloodlust that, that this young man should get the maximum sentence, the maximum sentence, the maximum sentence. We've got to show him. Throw him away. Lock him up and get rid of the key. Victoria Rivolo, hearing all of this, called the district attorney and said, I need to see you. She went and met with the district attorney and sat down. He said, what do you want? She said, I want amnesty for Ryan Cushing. I want no jail time for him. The DA said, there is no way I will agree to that. He dismissed her and sent her away. She called and visited him again. She continued to stay in touch with the district attorney until finally he agreed to the minimum sentence that could be given. Six months. The judge only signed off on this lighter sentencing once he heard that this was at the insistence of Victoria herself. And so that day when the sentencing was announced and the rest of the courtroom was crying out for vengeance... Ryan Cushing was crying as well. Head down, tears flowing. He slowly took two steps towards where Victoria Ruvolo was sitting. She says as he began to walk towards her, sobbing, her motherly instinct kicked in. She jumped up, walked towards him, wrapped her arms around him, enveloped him in an embrace, and through sobs, he said to her, I am so sorry. To which she said, I forgive you. Now go make something great of your life. In an interview with Victoria Ruvolo, she was questioned, what did you say to the DA that finally convinced him? And she said, I remember what I said. I said, God gave me a second chance at life, and I just passed it on. You know what? Victoria Ruvolo is a Christian. She was basically just updating a scripture that is the last verse in the passage that we read. It's from Ephesians 4, verse 32. We're going to put it on the screen, and I want you to read it with me today. Read it out. Be kind to each other, sympathetic, forgiving each other as God has forgiven you through Christ. That's what it says. 
Basically, that scripture verse says what Victoria said. God has given us a second chance. So we forgive one another and grant second chances to each other. Well, it's time for day one. By now you know the routine and a week off hasn't caused you to forget it that there is an opportunity for us to step through a door into a better tomorrow than we have had yesterday. I want to tell you something. Let me just move this to help some of you over there because there's something I don't want you to miss. For many of you, to get through this door today, you need a key. You need a key to unlock forgiveness in your life. And here's what I've learned about forgiveness. When you use the key of forgiveness to unlock the door, when you open the door, you'll discover that you are actually the one that you're setting free. Today, wouldn't you want to step into all that light? It begins by being willing to say, I forgive. I want us to bow our heads together.
witnesses, not just ones who have gone before us, but don't you know, your children, your friends, your neighbors, your parents, your coworkers, they need to know that not only you can get past your past, but you can live free from the sin that's entangled you before. Run with perseverance that race. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to step into the future that God has instead of living with all that regret from the past. And so some of you, this is the sermon for you. Today is the day. In this whole series, this is what you've been waiting for. Someone to come and say that you don't have to live forever under all that regret and all that pain and all that sorrow and all that sadness. And you can say, you know what? I'm not going to obsess over it anymore. I've confessed it. I know where I was wrong and God has forgiven me. I'm not obsessing over it anymore. And then I'm going to learn, not return. I'm going forward. <laughs> Maybe this one's just a little more work than some of the other sermons. And we step into the light. This is what he has for us. He wants to set you free. Will you dare trust him for it? I want us to bow our heads together as we close.